Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 24. You got myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. So this week, first of all, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry, as per normal. Um, then Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing Neil Jones. Um, so Neil Jones is a, an American who's been running a podcast called Without Your Head for quite a number of years now. Quite interesting chat Sam had, so we've got that as well. And also... We're going to be discussing um, films that have drug connotations or drug-related films and what are the impact of them films. So, without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. So for the last few weeks, it's been the Khan film market. Now, that came to an end this week. And one of the biggest sales, probably the biggest sale ever, was a thriller about slavery called Emancipation. Now, this is based on a very famous photo, which hopefully is on the screen right now. And essentially, this photo was like, it was just shown everywhere of like the whip marks on a black man's back during the slavery times. So Will Smith is starring in this film and producing it with Anton Fuqua, who uh, probably is being pronounced incorrectly his last name. But he did Training Day. He's done the, he's, he's consistently good director. Like he's done Equalizer. You know, he, he knows how to make a film. He's very much a journeyman director. And it sounds kind of cool. I mean, a hundred million is a lot to, to give a film before even producing it, but it means that now Apple are going to make the film, distribute it, and do everything for it. But it is the biggest acquisition ever. Before that was Hamilton, which actually has just been released this week on Disney+. Plus. So yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's a lot of money. And there is this argument, and I, I kind of agree with it, where essentially studios want to do something for, to, to show more equality and to show that they care about black history. <clears throat> or to help black talent. One article I was reading basically said, why not use that 100 million to fund like five independent films that are from like a more um, inclusive sort of crew? You know, tell those stories rather than spending 100 million on essentially more of a, what sounds like a popcorn take on history for the thriller element. But we'll see. One of my favorite directors, Pedro Modova, has announced his new film with Penelope Cruz. Now, if you know anything about Pedro Modova, he's a Spanish director, and he always works with Penelope Cruz, and he always gets the best out of her. Personally, she is a brilliant actress when she's not speaking a word of English. <laughs> this, new, this new film um, is going to be shooting at the beginning of next year. I kind of want to pick it up on this story because there's a lot of stories about films to be shot, but there is no point of when they're going to be shot. Whereas this film is looking to actually shoot, and Spain, I, you know, it's a lot safer to shoot there, I, I imagine, right now. They're going to do another bloody Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle film because you can never have too many, right? They're just constantly churning them out, different studios taking on their approach. Well, now Seth Rogen is going to produce one. <laughs> and it's going to be a CGI animation. And apparently Netflix are also doing a 2D animation film based on the original 90s TV series. So lots of Ninja Mutant Ninja Turtles running around soon. I mean, Seth Rogen's take on... Ninja Turtles might be kind of fun. Though, well, he, he clearly shows that when he loves something, like take the TV show Preacher, mm. he knows how to like fully give that world, and maybe it'll be probably one of the better versions, but I never liked the, the Turtles, and it's too much Turtles. Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Teenage... The, uh, the final note I have is uh, basically about our own horror anthologies. We've currently got some horror, horror anthologies out there. The two anthologies we're looking for submissions, one is called Bedtime Horror, and essentially, we're looking for horror films set around the bedroom, 10 to 20 minutes. Deadline is towards the end of the year. If you want to get involved with that anthology, then just send us an email at trashartsportsmouth at gmail.com, which is the same for the next anthology, A Five Day Haunting. We're looking for found footage, ghost movies, and we're hoping to do a kind of interactive premiere by the end of October. So we're looking for those films to be completed by the latest, the beginning of October. Again, if you want to know more details about that, then just go to that email address I said. I'll say it again, because why not? Trashartsportsmouth at gmail.com Thanks for that, Sam. So Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Neil Jones, who's an American, who um, has his own podcast. And uh, very interesting chat. So, Sam, over to you. I'm here on Trash Arts Take with Neil Jones from Without Your Head Podcast. How you doing, man? You good? I'm very good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. It's, uh, it's quite late, but I imagine it's a lot earlier where you are. Yeah, it's a little after six here. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Is it still quite warm? 
Yeah, it's very hot out. I just got back from my walk. Oh, nice. We've we've got rain and grey usual Britishness over here. It's great today, but it's uh, it's um, buggy. It's still very hot, which is even worse, I think. I'd rather, if it's hot, it's a little better if it's uh, sunny out. But when it's gray and hot, it's uh, not particularly nice. Oh, yeah. Being British, we know that well. Um, right. <laughs> where did the love for a film, in particular horror, start? Uh, definitely when I was a kid. Uh, my mom, single mom and uh, older brother, he's nine years older, and... Uh, earliest memories are, you know, watching movies with them, and uh, she would take us to the, uh, she would take my older brother to the drive-in, so he'd be like, you know, 13 or 14 and bring his friends, and uh, instead of, you know, just uh, getting a babysitter or something, take me along, and I'd be four or five years old, and so uh, the, the first movie I remember seeing in the drive-in, uh, we see the drive-in, is uh, Night of the Living Dead, oh, wow. and uh, and I've told this story before, but I remember it's, uh, uh, the this, this first movie I remember seeing, and uh, when the when the the pickup truck uh, blows up, and the zombies start to eat them, uh, I start I got upset, and my mom turned to me and she just said, "Oh, they're just having a barbecue," and I was like, "Oh, okay, it's, it's fine." Then. And uh, ever since then, no, I just I like movies in general, not just horror, but uh, but I also I love horror movies. So definitely from my mom, I think. See, I remember like the old stories from the 60s where they accidentally uh, screened Night of the Living Dead at the matinee screenings. Right. And yeah. Yeah, no, my mom just didn't care. She even signed <laughs> a thing at the video store that I, I could rent any movies. <laughs> it's not a, not a bad position to be in. Right. So how did with uh, Without Your Head start? Because that's been around, what is it, 16 years now? Yeah, well, so... Uh, 14, since 2006, so I guess 14 or 15, I guess 15 would be included 2006. Uh, so 2000, actually the very first episode was 2005. Uh, 2005, we started doing a pro wrestling show. Uh, this was even before the term podcast was around, so we called it internet, internet radio at the time. Yeah. And uh, that's called In Your Head. And so that October, we did a Halloween special, and we called it Without Your Head. Because uh, we didn't, we couldn't think of a name. There. I was like, "What do we call this?" And, so, and uh, my friend Ron, who was on the show, he's like, "Well, this is in your head. Let's call this one without your head." Nice. And I thought it was funny, so we went with that. And uh, I had a great time because uh, I love you know horror movies. And uh, since 2006, we made it you know its own show, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. But the origins was it was the Halloween special of our pro wrestling show. Okay. And how do you like strike the balance between promoting indie acts or indie um, filmmakers and also giving a great platform for older like genre icons? Because you balanced it so well. How did that start? Like, was it going to the comic cons? Yes, that's, or? A, that's an interesting question because when we started uh, the show, it was primarily um, legends. And I think uh, a lot of that was. Uh, you know, we just started the show and we like, hey, let's try to get uh, people on for movies we were watching. And also, uh, when we started, with, so it was me, uh, Troy, who's still on the show with me, my brother, and uh, John, you know, who's not on the show anymore. But John really doesn't like to watch new movies, which is a, a big reason why he, you know, he stopped doing the show. Because mm. uh, it's cool to watch old movies, but... Like, it really limits how much, especially when you're doing the show for years, it's like, you know, how many times can we talk about uh, Friday the 13th Part 4 or something, which, yeah. I mean, it's fun to talk about, but it's like, you know, you have to talk about some other things. And uh, so he wasn't, in, and he really doesn't like independent uh, movies, so that kind of splintered uh, the show. But, but I, you know, after doing the show a few years and talking to him, you know, I even mean, though I think about that, though, the very first year, their sixth guest on the show was Adam Green. So even then, I guess I was interested in having, um, you know, independent uh, filmmakers on uh, right before Hatchet came out. Uh, nice. I, I think it's good to balance that way because, like, uh, I always think this way, like, the um, a lot of the, uh, like, a Kane Hodder, like Bradley, these uh, TJ Souls, all these people, they do bring in an audience. Hmm. And then, uh, so don't the independent people, but it's a different audience. But if, if you can then expose... Um, the independent artists uh, uh, to to the audience who are tuning in just to just to hear people that you know the name value that they know. 
Yeah. Uh, I think it helps introduce people who might not be interested in uh, on the independent level, you know, to uh, to new things. So that that's always been my goal, and I hope that works out. Because a lot of times, um, especially when we just did the podcast version, now since we do the video, it's a little different. But I, if we had a lot of really like independent people that a lot of people might not know, I would try to pair them up on the same show with uh, someone who might have more name value. Oh, nice. Just because I thought it would uh, it would help them, you know, uh, gain a new audience. Let's see. You have a perfect blend of giving exposure to like yeah both sides, independent and people more well known. And I think um, and plus it's just like I also like to watch that. And uh, I know you say you mentioned the conventions and stuff. Uh, the festivals probably um, definitely help um, with more independent artists on the show because mm. I would meet them at, at the festivals. You know, become friends with them or even just like their stuff and then I'm on the show to talk about that's good man it's that beautiful kind of community and vibe and I like recently um, during like COVID and stuff you've obviously been doing I mean you did them beforehand but you've been doing a lot of stream parties for filmmakers pretty much like across the world and uh, of course the uh, the film festival as well how's that been like put together How, how's oh yeah I, I love it really no we didn't do that before at all oh actually, we actually did do a movie we used to do a movie night years ago when uh, Annabelle Lecter was on the show with us but it wasn't on Facebook. It was on a, a, a separate uh, website, and it, it was fun. But it was actually really fun. But we didn't usually get like a big audience. It'd just be like five or six of us usually. But um, during the pandemic, uh, part of it was that you know, I myself was getting depressed, not being able to go to the movies and festivals, and I knew a lot of my friends uh, who make movies. You know, uh, their stuff wasn't being seen. And just a lot of uh, just people who watch movies like us, you know, needed something to do. And I thought, well, maybe I'll put together uh, you know, like a, a festival online. And I know there's some limitations there because I don't want to get anyone in trouble with their dis- distribution or if they are submitting to uh, physical festivals. Because sometimes if you show online, uh, you know, you're, it kind of, it, it, you won't be uh, eligible to show them at, a, a, you know, at another festival. But really, I should be up to the filmmaker, you know, to know all that stuff. But I always like to put that out there. And uh, there has been, I don't want to talk about this so much, but there has been a few people who, who aren't happy that, that I do that I do the uh, the uh, online festivals and the watch parties because uh, they think it diminishes uh, film that should be seen in a the theater. And I understand that, but at the same yeah. time, they can't be. And things, you know, evolve. You know, we are in a different time. But so yeah, that came about. The first thing we did was the uh, the Severed Limbs Film Festival, and I, I I expected it to be a fun time, but I didn't expect you know so many people to be there, or uh, so many people to enjoy it. Uh, the film, so many filmmakers afterwards, you know, messaged me and texted me and emailed me that uh, it meant a lot to them that their that their films were shown to an audience might not have seen it otherwise. And some people even had stuff that they never showed anywhere. Uh, they didn't know if it would even have an audience. And it really was made them happy that, you know, some people saw it and uh, that they liked it. And now they're, you know, trying to uh, to get it uh, out there even, even more. And then from there, we just started doing the, uh, the full-length movies. Uh, because some people were, you know, trying to spit stuff. And I was like, well, it just, you know, if it's a short festival, I can't really show like an hour movie because it just takes up a lot of time. And so I thought, well, we'll just start showing, showing some uh, full movies. And the whole thing's really a, a been a great time for me. And uh, it seems like people are really enjoying it. That's the thing, man. Like, one, one of the great things I've loved about what you've done with your watch parties is that there's a real community vibe. You get a real response. Yeah. And for someone like when I had my experience with Millennial Killer and The Truthful Out, I don't necessarily know your audience, and your audience don't know me. So to be able to watch and see them respond to all these little points within the films. Uh, it's, it's, it was it was just amazing, despite being like late for being UK and stuff. It was like it's been totally wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's always been a big part of just doing the show for me is the community aspect and, and going to the festivals. I uh, like you know a group of people that even if they're all from different area, different parts of the world, and even have different like lifestyles, you know, uh, but they all have the same love for horror movies or weird movies or movies mm. in general. And uh, that's really been missing since I can't go. Since none of us can go to the festivals or conventions, or and uh, 
and so that's always been a big part for me from doing the show and I think this has really helped that doing the uh, the festival the watch parties because everyone can get together and, and interact and of course you can watch stuff at home and that's that's fine but uh, to watch to watch especially like weird movies I think or uh, horror movies uh, with a group of people it really adds to the experience most definitely and it, it, you get a proper audience response and sometimes like with a festival I mean, I love going to festivals and stuff, but you're in a dark room. You can't look around and right. see everyone's right. yeah, reaction, yeah. but their comments yeah. are... Yeah, people will get mad at you too if you just start yelling, hey, look at this, or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your relationship with uh, Michael J. Epstein, because he's done a good couple of anthologies with us, such as... Um, yeah. <clears throat> such as Conspiracy X. Um, he's recently... He was the actor in Philia. Um, you, you, your name's always popped up with him. In fact, that's how I kind of like started paying attention to Without Your Head from seeing Michael J. Epstein. Oh, with very you. cool. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll let him know that, it, you know, being friends with him, I thought it was all, you know, worthless. But, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, so how we met was, um, I interviewed Paul McElarney, who made, uh, uh, what, I forget, uh, I think Conky Holocaust was the movie he was promoting at the time. Yeah. And, uh, he's a local filmmaker for me. He's in Boston. And, uh, and Michael had, uh, I think he was a cinematographer on that. So he listened to the interview and, uh, one of, either he sent me a friend request or I sent her a request and we started talking. And then, um, we're the uh, same age and a lot of, I think same like sensibilities, same sense of humor. And so we, you know, just started talking a lot. Uh, we met at the time he was living in Boston, uh, him and, and Sophia Cassioli, his, uh, his wife. And um, I didn't meet her till a little bit later, but I met him. I forget where I met him. I think I don't know. I, don't know, I met him somewhere. And then, um, so what? Ha how we started working together though was um, Boston Underground Film Festival. Uh, they had already moved to LA, but they had uh, come back for Boston Underground Film Festival. And at the time, I had just had uh, surgery. This was just 2019. Mm. Um, really, not that long ago, I guess. Uh, I had a major surgery to, I had uh, multiple hernias. One was uh, a, what they call a strangulating uh, hernia that was uh, blocking my bowel. So it was, a, it was a really extensive surgery. And part of the surgery was I was going to lose my belly button. So I posted about this on uh, Facebook. And Michael was like, oh, everyone else like, oh, wow, you know, I hope this goes well and all these things. Because, you know, there's always a chance uh, surgery can go back to the surgery. And, um, and so he was like, hey, let's make a documentary about this. And I was like, oh, wow. okay. And so I didn't really know what he meant by that. I thought he meant like a straight documentary. So uh, he came, so uh, him and Sophia had come down, they were selling their house uh, in Somerville, which is near Boston. And then they were going to Boston and Ground Film Festival. So I came out, uh, I was going there anyway, but uh, I stayed next to three days and I slept on their couch. And uh, we filmed the documentary on Bellicus Desidero. And I thought it was, very, I thought it was great. And a lot of people seemed to really like it. And uh, so when we started filming it, uh, so he started, you know, asking me to explain different things. And, and right away, he just kind of stopped. He's like, no, do it, you know, more scary. So then I really got what he was going for. They were definitely on the same page where uh, it's a very dry sense of humor, which played totally uh, deadpan, very serious, which to me, he really brings up the humor. And uh, it was so fun filming that because uh, there wasn't a script or anything. He would just throw out a couple, like, you know, talk about this or that. Mm. And it was all ad-libbed. I think the whole thing was probably about a half hour. And then he uh, did an excellent job editing it down to, to four minutes. And, uh, and uh, Sophia got a lot of great shots. We just were walking around uh, Cambridge filming stuff. And some of this, I don't know, I think you've seen it. And uh, some of the stuff in the... Uh, it was like after parties. We're at Boston Underground Film Festival and we just filmed stuff there. I don't think most people there knew what we were doing. We just filmed it. But it was very fun. And it was going to play at this year's Boston Underground Film Festival but uh, it was canceled, unfortunately. Uh, but from there, he asked me to come out and um, well, we were talking about, uh, I can't go too much in, into because these movies are connected and what's kind of secret. But yeah. So we were talking about doing a, a movie. We had, he had this idea for a movie about a, this one I could talk about, a mockumentary about 
two actors who have a rivalry over playing a uh, a mass slasher mm-hmm. like an old film. Uh, inspired by a lot of real life uh, things like this. Uh, and even going back to Creature from the Black Lagoon, I know Rico Browning and Ben Chapman had had you know, some rivalry there about you know who she deserves credit for the creature. Uh, trying to think of some other ones. Uh, Bob uh, Bob Elmore and, and Bill Johnson over uh, uh, Motherface and Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two. There's a whole bunch. Of them. So I was like, yeah, that would be a good idea. And um, so he's like, so from there, it was like, uh, it's like you, to make this really work, we needed to film it at a at a festival at a convention. So we had like a, a backdrop. Otherwise, it would just cost too much to bring a bunch of people and uh, get you know to build our own convention. And so. Uh, I have a good relationship with uh, Evan McGar, who runs Mad Monster uh, Convention, and I, I was like, I gave him the idea, and he loved it. He's like, "Come on out, we'll let you film there," which was invaluable because I don't, I don't think it would the movie would, which is not finished yet, but I don't think it would work without an actual convention there. Yeah. And so we did that together. That was actually in February, but I came out in LA in December of last year to film another movie that, that is uh, connected but I can't really talk about it. but uh, uh, so we went out there and I had a small role uh, which was very fun I'm very proud of and I uh, originally was also going to cook this was a small cast and crew we rented a cabin and, and filmed the movie and stayed there for like a week uh, but uh, some of the other people ended up cooking but I also did the BTS footage and he asked me can you do the BTS footage and I was like oh yeah sure and then I immediately afterwards went to Google and Googled that because I didn't know what BTS footage meant. Yeah. And I was like, oh, behind the scenes, yeah, I could do that. So, But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just think we had sure, uh, a lot of the same sense of humor. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been good. We worked on three projects. and hope, well, We do have some other stuff planned uh, once uh, things calm down. So, uh, hopefully that will be sooner than later. So um, that's actually also I, real quick. Sorry, uh, how I met uh, Trista Robinson, who's the new co-host on the show, was mm-hmm. in uh, December uh, when I was out there. Uh, she was in the movie. Oh, nice. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, because I obviously had to look over your IMDb just because I wanted to see if you've ever moved into directing. And um, the documentary called "Year of a Maggot." Can you talk about that, or is that the behind-the-scenes video? No, I can. Yeah, I can talk about. So that was uh, a film we were, I was doing with Paul McElarney, who oh, uh, nice. I talked about earlier. Yeah, did, yeah. Uh, um, I think he's in Self Tape. Uh, I think he's in one of our films. Okay, yeah, because it's weird. Though. There's a lot of uh, a lot of the Boston uh, people do a lot of uh, stuff with uh, a lot of people in the UK. I noticed. Oh, nice. But anyway, so uh, so another guy like uh, we get along very well. Uh, probably a little different than me and Michael. I think me and Michael are much more similar. Me and Paul are different. He's like really into punk rock and got a lot of tattoos. I have no tattoos. Don't really know anything about punk rock. But uh, but anyway, we get along well. And uh, I went to the rap party for The Streets Run Red, and I did a bunch of interviews there. Um, and he liked those, so he's like, can I use these on the Blu-ray? And I was like, yeah, of course. So I sent him all them. And then um, when he was starting production on um, his next movie, which I don't know if it ever had a name. It might have. I'm not positive. Uh, but he was doing a, a, a martial arts movie. Hmm. And he was like, can you document all this? Uh, the whole making of, of you know this movie. And I was like, yeah. And so the plan was, um, I was spending a day with each member of, of the film. And it really wasn't really about the making of the film so much as it was really about um, the sacrifices people have, uh, go through to make independent film. Because mm. these are all people who have you know, regular jobs and families, some of them are married, some were getting married, and uh, how you can balance like an actual life you know, with your love of trying to make these movies. And so I spent a day with, uh, with several of the people and got some really great footage. Uh, during that time, Paul lost his passion for uh, filmmaking, with ma- uh, making movies. So the, that project just kind of stopped. I still have all the footage. Uh, the film will never, the actual uh, martial arts movie will not be made. Uh, 
I still have all the footage from the documentary, and he's like, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, I, I don't know if I ever talked about this on the show, but the plan, so he's like, you know, maybe you should just make a documentary about Boston filmmaking, and that's fine, but I think there's a lot of things like that. Uh, my idea was, which it's been a couple of years now, so, but he could still do it, was I would go back and interview all the people we did interview. I did interview, and uh, see how their life was affected by the end of uh ungovernable films and especially Paul because mm. I, I would like to see because he's so he was so passionate about making movies and then just to totally lose that passion I think that might be an interesting documentary kind of like the the death of a dream in a way which yeah, sounds depressing great. but I, I don't I don't know where his mindset is right now so it could be depressing or it could be uplifting because maybe he's found uh, that same passion because he does music now. And so that's never been finished. But I still have a lot of the footage. For all of them. <clears throat> well, hopefully that's something you can get to because that sounds like a, it's always fascinating to see when an artist feels the need to stop. And, you know, like you said, get into music and bend their art into a different direction. So that could be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, my last question, I always ask people this and they always mention to me budgets, but um, a dream project or in the case of with the podcast a dream guest that you'd like to interview? Hmm, interesting. Uh, dream guest, let's see. A lot of them have passed away, unfortunately. You could bring back, uh, of course, Carlos or Vincent Price. But uh, something realistic, I guess. Uh, I really tried to get Ray, another one passed away. I really tried to get Ray Harryhausen on the show. Uh -huh. uh, it almost happened several times. Unfortunately, it never really came to be. I really like Roger Corman on the show. Um, John Carpenter, obviously, though. Yeah, yeah. I almost had Wes Craven on the show. Uh, I'd actually talked to his, uh, his agent or his assistant at the time. It almost happened. This was in the early days of the show, too. It never uh, came to be. Uh, Stephen King would be good. Clive Barker. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of, like, real big guests that would yeah, be awesome. Yeah. Um, Dream Project. Uh, so... I mean, I've actually been writing scripts since I've been doing this stuff with Michael because that really has uh, uh, lit like a fire like on the creative side because I really had a great time making the, the movie in December. And I'm my own worst critic, so if I didn't think I was good at it, I, I, I would say that. But I honestly thought I was very good in the movie, too. That was very fun. I'd be up to do more uh, acting. Uh, but also the creative side. So I've been uh, writing. Uh, I have a, I have like one, like yeah, one finished uh, short script, and then a bunch of ideas for other things. Uh, but I also found that I, I'm very. I, I fear anyone else reading them. I think like, they'll, they'll think either sucks or like that has some kind of mental issues. But so I guess yeah, I definitely would have to get over that to uh, to actually make anything. But I would like to uh, to make something. No, that's good, man. And like, yeah, when, when you do... But I don't want to say that the exact details because then uh, someone might steal it. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. But if you ever do get over past that fear and you want someone to read, I'm more than happy to have a read well, thank anything. You. I appreciate that. Yeah. Tristan Ross, is, a lot of people, but I appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tristan's been really uh, trying to get me to send, send her... Uh, That'd be fantastic. I'll send an image. Uh, or I'll send it. But yeah, uh, the one I sent well, <clears throat> thank you very much for joining us, man. And yeah, if people want to check out your, your podcast, it's Without Your Head, which obviously is Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, it's uh, Facebook, Twitter. My, well, I guess it is a MySpace, but it's not been updated <laughs> for 10 years, so it's probably not the best place to go. Uh, YouTube, Instagram. So just put it Without Your Head and you'll find it. Yeah, we'll put some links down below as well. Well, thank you very much for joining us, man. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. I appreciate that asking me to come on. It's no worries. It's been good talking. Yeah, and I really enjoy uh, watching your your pro your projects. It's, uh, we've been doing stuff uh, on the Facebook with with uh, a lot of your stuff. Yeah, your, your shorts, your features. I really uh, and I've been watching some of your stuff on YouTube. I, I think it's all uh, it's all uh, good stuff. Oh, thank you very much, man. Well, have a good day. Thank you, as well. Bye bye. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for that. I like the fact that um, he actually started the podcast as a wrestling podcast and it slowly moved into horror. That's really interesting. This week, guys, we wanted to discuss um, films 
with drug related themes within them. So we had a look at a load of different films and the different kind of connotations and the different presentation of films and the way that they use drugs within them. And um, so yeah, guys, first one I would probably talk about is Blow. Well that's the thing, I think, because we were trying to work out the best way to talk about these things. And if we kind of fit them in the categories, Blow fits probably one of the more prominent drug sort of stories, crime. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> And it's always with those sort of stories, pretty much every biopic about a drug crime lord will always lead to the same up to the excess and then boom, either prison or death. Crash down to reality. Yeah, it's pretty much every story, even even to a looser sense like um, with Boogie Nights. Mm. Boogie Nights obviously is more about the porn industry, but the effect that cocaine had on the porn industry at that time ruined any kind of ability to you know not let ego overtake well i think cocaine particularly seems to be used much more often in these gangster uh, like gangster type crime films as well um because i mean you know scarface for example and again you see that same trajectory of sort of like that upward and then you know crashing down back to uh, reality it's kind of almost that the films mirrored the actual high of the drug yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah. if you think about cocaine when you're on cocaine not that i know um, <laughs> but so I'm told that um, you basically have an up don't you and you're like oh I can take on the world you're positive you're buzzing the next day nah you're crashed you're burned you're like oh god calm down I think that's what they call it um, <laughs> but yeah and the films have the same trajectory yeah and you could almost say that <clears throat> for most films about drugs they do definitely structure it that way so if you take um, if you want to go like a completely different perspective think of films about cannabis Mm. Most cannabis films, generally speaking, are comedies. Yeah. And they're usually something silly happens that gets way over the top. Yeah. And, and the, usually going off on a tangent, which yeah. is what happens, yeah, again, like when, when you're high. I, I Not don't know that whether, I know. <laughs> I don't know whether this is something that the filmmakers are openly aware that there's a structure already based there, or they've just gone with it with, you know, those sort of story tropes. I don't know. Because you can say it to a lot of things. If I was to run through a bunch of drugs right now, you can kind of already associate what sort of film it's going to be. Generally speaking, when you have like a film about heroin, there's a love story or there's some sort of poverty line being discussed. Hmm. If you've got a film about acid, it's going to go mental, it's going to be trippy, because why wouldn't it be? So you have all these kind of different sort of archetypes in there, or even like ecstasy, you're talking about a party scene. Hmm. It's all about what those drugs do for different people and... Each drug, filmmakers like to be able to kind of, um, even if it's like in a cinematic style. So, with Spun. Now, mm. Spun is a film about crystal meth. And it's so, like, the editing is insane. The way it's shot, the way the dynamic of just, you've got one shot inside, like, as someone snorting, and then you've got animation being thrown in, and just weird graphics. It throws everything at you, because those sort of drugs give you that upper sense where it is all just erratic your yeah. mind can't focus in on one place it gives you that sort of sensory kind of overload of almost <clears throat> being able to feel the imagery because it's so stark and so sort of you know powerful and the same with um requiem for a dream yeah. when yeah, you yeah. see those moments of them setting up to take the heroin and stuff and it's just like that click of the lighter and the you eye know, and yeah the pupil and... i think you've got it right there the sensory overloads that's what it's about. It's about to give you that feeling. Because when you take, especially those sort of drugs, they're such an extreme high. And it's everything, like cocaine, everything's right up there and everything's over hyper-realised. So when people do it in films, you're either relying on a brilliant performance, which if anything's more going, this is the reality of it, or you need to show them what it's like in their eyes. Mm. I feel like films like Spun and Requiem for a Dream, it seemed to be kind of like a trend at the beginning of 2000s, where drug films came a little bit more... I suppose almost like music videos with a bit more like kind of a lot quicker kip, a lot, sorry, a lot quicker cuts, a lot of different kind of shots coming in, just a bit more dynamicness to the way mm. it's told. Yeah, and even with um, uh, human traffic, for example, um, mm. or hu human trafficking or human traffic, I can't remember what it's I think it's human traffic. Human traffic, yeah. <laughs> But that uh, that film does exactly the same thing where it gives it almost this presentational sort of like uh, overhyped kind of style that feels like, uh, you know, a music video or mm. or even the moment where he's walking around the party, it could feel like a, an episode, like something on MTV, you know, where they're, they're just sort of 
uh, cribs or something like that. It just had those kind of those kind of feelings to it. I think I get what you mean with that. A lot of that's definitely down to the impact of train spotting, of course. Mm. Train spotting basically kind of opened those doors, and because the nineties is very much drug culture is so important to the nineties. Yeah. And you just saw that wave post train spotting of those kind of films showing you that. There's one particular sequence to me. Although I like, I know people who've taken heroin, so when they've described it and seen it and connected with that, they go, yeah, that's like what it's like. The shot um, where he has the overdose and they play Lou Reed's Perfect Day. It perfectly soundtracks that moment but the whole shot just sinks into the ground mm. and he's just stuck and he's just being carried through those moments and the music's all calm. I think that's another thing that those films do so well is that they choose the music to fit the drugs. You just stole one. I've been trying to say that Sorry. for the last... Like, you keep you two have been back and forth and I was like, every <laughs> single... We're trying to jump in with soundtrack. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right. You're right. <clears throat> soundtrack is like um, a massive part of it. Mm. And I think not only does it represent the film itself subject to what the, the drug substance is, but it also represents the time period that they're in. Yeah, yeah, so, definitely. Again, like you mentioned Scarface earlier, they used a lot of very popular songs at the time to sort of reinforce the kind of buzz and how he was on this trajectory. Well, think of the main theme tune to Scarface. Push, Push it, it to, to the, the limit. limit. <laughs> Standing on the razor's yeah. edge. It's the most coked up song ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon the band was coked up when they made it? It's the 80s. Probably, <laughs> Probably yeah. <laughs> when you look at when the first, well, what, what I would consider to be the first, like, Hollywood drug film would probably definitely be Reefer Madness, which, yeah. of course, was a propaganda tool to show how bad cannabis was in teenagers. Well, it's sort of trying to be a pop propaganda tool. Yeah, I can't yeah. see how that would have been very successful at all. Um, I, I think the first actual one that kind of gave more uh, uh, positive perspective, or at least an overall perspective on it is the classic Easy Rider. Yeah. Easy Rider was all about that counterculture of the 60s with the hippie movement and the more relaxation of like having sex and partying and not caring about the man and just taking drugs. I mean, the literally opening bit is they got some drugs inside the, well, they were the bike and then the music. Acid through that. Like, is that, that was the drug of that film. Well, no, to be honest with you, they take loads of different drugs. They well, smoke yeah. weed, they do uppers, but there's that really great scene in the graveyards mm. where they take the acids. Yeah, I remember, I remember watching that scene. That yeah. was, in, that was in, uh, quite intense. Apparently they, I think they took acid for real on that scene. Because mm. apparently Peter Fonda, where he's like going, oh, I hate you so much. Dennis Hopper kind of pushed him to make it about his Hollywood dad. So yeah, it's, it's crazy when you can do that. And that film really opened it up for, well, Hollywood. It was called the new Hollywood. Mm. And it's interesting that when there's a massive change in creative shift, there's always usually drugs involved. If it's not the filmmaker taking the drugs, it's what the stories are trying to tell about the drugs. And I mean, I, you, to me, you see it more prominently in music, but you definitely see it quite strongly in films. Yeah, I think that's the, is the, the interesting thing about what, what um, precedes what in terms of like the style of the, of the film. Because the style of the films are always based on the on the sort of the impact those drugs can mm. have on people and, and they really seem to encapsulate that so you you've got to wonder whether whether that's sort of like uh, naturally drawn in that direction because of the what what the, the kind of personalities that the drug brings out in that or whether that is sort of something that continuously directors have always tried to do when dealing with drugs because um uh, not to sort of like turn it round and focus on you but your your film the wasters um that we we yeah. we showed online recently. I uh, don't know if you guys caught it or anything, but uh, just saying. I think it's still <laughs> on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, check it out on YouTube. Um, but you were you were discussing um, method uh, methadone in that film. Yeah, for me, the wasters was all about like the horrible moment in 2010 when methadone just took over everywhere, and I was part of that. And I saw saw the wasters as kind of like a swan song to not want to do those drugs again. Because like, when you're in it, you think it's all hedonistic greatness, and then when you're out of it, you see the reality and go, oh, maybe there's the highest short, but there's a hell of a lot of lows. And I think that's what, even, I mean, even like The Easy Rider, all those kind of films, they do the same thing. One of the things I just realised when you were saying that is that Requiem for a Dream, Train Spotting, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, they're all, they're all based on books. Because mm. uh, I was trying to think about how does Fear and Loathing fit in with that idea of directors, you know, creative intake because I don't feel like he took acid and decided to do that 
fear and loathing is like a perfect interpretation of um, well, fear and loathing. If you've ever read the book, the, the, the illustrations are like pitch perfect to the film itself. So I suppose it depends also on, yeah, like with those drug films of how, how can you picture those perfectly? One of the great cases of the film that's not really a drug book, but it is Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. That's clearly someone on a lot of drugs writing some crazy shit. And you always see it in the artistic representation. You never see a muted colored like Alice in Wonderland. It's always hyperactive. It always feels like if you've ever taken acid, feels like you're on acid completely. I feel like Tim Burton's always on acid. Yeah. <laughs> Just he did an Alice in Wonderland, didn't he? Yeah, and that was very like hyper realized in that kind of way. But that's sort of to me, with Tim Burton and stuff like that, that's like post understanding. So it's like, well, what would it be like on acid rather than I'm someone who takes acid and Yeah, yeah, I know, but there's always that kind of weird quirky randomness to it. Mm. It's interesting though when you when you look at like scenes and stuff, like you were saying earlier, to dictate time and what kind of time periods. Drugs are always a good indication of seeing where society was. So there's a film um, called Party Monster. And Party Monster's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Party Monster's pure decadence. It's the campus film ever. It's, it's brilliant. But it is about the scene kids. And the scene kids were very much related with ecstasy and uppers. Mm. And um, yeah, the whole film is so hyper-realized. Again, it's so on the same drug that it's trying to tell you about, you know? Everything's ridiculous. It's got like a lot of... Um, hallucinatory kind of imagery within it because I think I think if I'm right they start to move on to heroin don't they they're definitely the harder drugs because all drug scene films someone's gonna go you know what let's bring in the harder drugs that's how things collapse it's always the same story with any sort of drug scene moment you never really even the, the stories of the hippies and stuff it would still that the darker drugs start to kick in you know mm. I was thinking of Wolf of Wall Street <coughs> they take the lemons mm. See, Wolf of Wall Street's an interesting one because although it does focus heavily on um, a lot of illegal drugs with cocaine and stuff like that, it does should show a nice little light on the more, I can't remember, loots and stuff like that. Because if, if I'm right, I might be wrong, but I, I think back then they were more legal than they are now. But were they not like a numbing thing? So like if you yeah. had loads of pain and stuff, you'd take a loot and it would kind of relax your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they end up popping loads because they get a high out of it. Mm. Yeah, and there's like that richness, and I think that's where that sort of sits in with Scarface in some regards of that excess. But they seem to do it more with like the prescribed stuff. But then you know it's based on true stories. So funny you saying about Reefer Madness. I was in a musical. Uh, was it the same musical? It was Reef. Yeah, it was like from the originals because the original was written in the 1920s, I think. And the whole you were saying about the prop, you don't understand how it'd be propaganda. The main story of it is that like you've got this crime. Uh, creepy gangster guy who I played um, <laughs> I can see it. yeah yeah had a little drawn on mustache and stuff it was cool <laughs> I can grow that now um, and uh, he kind of ludes this really like young um, lure sorry this really young like up and coming star of a kid into smoking weed yeah. and then kind of corrupts him yeah, it yeah, all but goes that's wrong the, that's the thing the, the, in the film I think someone dies and there's yeah. some like, serious uh, and I can't see how anyone would watch that and, and think like yeah. oh, that that is what happens it's, when you um, smoke weed it's different <laughs> it's times so you think if you think back in like the 1920s and stuff things weren't as accessible as what they would be now so we could see something on the news and go oh crap like They've started taking this new drug. That must be bad. But then you kind of rationalise and go, "Well, actually." Whereas I then think, I think you kind of face I, value. I love there would have been snuff at the time, though. Like, yeah, a lot of like, people were taking yeah, drugs. I suppose so opium was, was drugs, still around. But drugs were drugs were much more commonplace. Just, back TV and media would have been more would... focused towards like a richer class as well, because nobody mm. would have been able to have that media to access it. So I imagine when they started doing reefer madness, it was to try and get the the middle class, upper class white kids not to take the drugs that all the people on the much lower class yeah. we're taking and mm. um, it's interesting though when you look at the horrors of drugs because you can't there's the hedonistic side of drugs but like we said there is always a downward spiral it's a key element because it's the only way to get away from addiction in itself when you look at um horror horror does some interesting things when it comes to drugs there's a film called um, naked lunch naked lunch is directed by david cronenberg it's based on the book by naked lunch by william s burroughs who was one of my favourite authors, all he wrote about was being on drugs. He wrote these surrealist masterpieces. But all of his work is so visually 
banned in many countries if you try and picture what he wrote, that you can create into film. So what David Cronenberg did is he explored the fact that his first book, Junkie, is all about every single drug he's ever taken and like what it did to him. So he kind of combines all of those more crazier ideas that you'd find in the original book of Naked Lunch and he's seeing them for real, but his friends are watching him on this like complete downward spiral of taking all these drugs. Mm. And they almost, the other metaphor in that film is that literature itself is a drug. Because that's the other thing with something so addictive and so powerful, it becomes a drug in itself. There's a film, there's a vampire film called The Addiction, which I watched recently by <coughs> Abel Ferrer. And essentially it's about um, like, a, she's, I think she's just like a uni student in New York and she gets bitten by a vampire. But the addiction, because she doesn't want to hurt anyone at first, it's that like almost heroin addiction. It's that desire to have it. And at first she starts injecting it before the desire becomes so strong and she just starts doing it, like vampirizing everyone. Dak and left, right and center and everyone's Vampirizing. <laughs> Not the greatest word to use, but vampirism is a good thing with drugs in, in that regards. But we'll talk about vampires in a, in a couple of weeks time. But it's that interesting point where horror can bring in those more vivid, vivid imagery, but the symbolism can work quite nicely. It's just like we said before in a couple of weeks ago with demons and mental health. Drugs and horror, you can see why the correlations work Go well. hand in hand. The other sides of the horrors, if we take away the more fantastical element and the genre of horror, is the reality-based horrors. There are so many stories about people who take drugs and you see them slowly, gradually, their life goes to shit, basically. I think you find these quite prominent in um, stories that are love stories. There's a film called Candy, which um, Heath Ledger was in, and Abby Cornish. And it's a beautiful love story about two people who love each other, but they love heroin. One tries to quit it, but the other one can't quit it. Story is kind of routine. But when you see more and more of those indie films, you realise it's quite a routine love, love story, really, where someone's got a higher addiction that they can't quit. And it's a question of, well, you need to be normal in society or this drug is killing you sort of thing. And I think I can't, it is showing those horrors without going too much of an extreme like stereotype that you can go where you're like, oh, you're poor, you're gonna prostitute yourself, you're gonna do that because you can't get your bag of weed. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's very easy when people fall into that. Whereas love stories, you can just have a bit more of a human connection because drugs do change who we are as a person. We do change from like, especially if you're taking one, like more of an upper drug or something, <clears throat> that contain, can completely consumes your life. And I think love is that closest connection to tell that sort of story of seeing someone truly change, if that makes sense. That's the thing. I mean, it, it, it does seem like, like we said before, that this is, these are like drug specific, because this, this is specifically talking about heroin, really. Yeah. Because um, like you said, you can't imagine those kind of films being done with weed or, or even with cocaine, really, or, or any of the other drugs that we've, we've discussed because of the way that they uh, affect people and the, the influence that they have on people and their actions and, and those kind of things. I mean, I think, to be honest, my favourite my favorite type of drug film has got to be uh, weed films uh, because they are, always make you feel good. They're always <laughs> a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah. See, when I used to say lots of drugs, I used to love watching Requiem for a Dream because I'd be like, wow, at least my life's not that bad. <laughs> so, you know. It's one way to make own. yourself feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Stick on Pineapple Express or something, man. <laughs> <laughs> Harold and Kumar get the munchies. <laughs> That's the thing. I think one of the other sides, for people who don't take drugs whatsoever and they only have from the hearsay of people they know or what media supplies with them of what drugs are, so it, they are important in that sense. And there are some things that really piss me off, especially when you see people smoke weed and they just hallucinate immediately. I'm like, what the fuck are they smoking? That seems way too extreme. But then there has Where to be a high of realize. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can understand from that, that respect, but you know, like with, with drugs and films, it, it's important because you get to understand a bit of what's going on in society. And a director gets to really explore what mentally it feels like up there and what physically your body thinks is going on. I think not only that, for an actor, it's a great way to kind of develop a character oh, and yeah. explore that character if further. If you win an Oscar or if you're a drug addict, you know, it's happened a good few times. That is the other point, yeah. For a performer, it is one of those key roles that you like tick off and go, yeah, I've got my accolades for playing a drug addict, poor person. <laughs> <laughs> Did they get a trophy? Who knows? They get an Oscar? 
So I think you're always going to have drugs hand in hand with film. Because like we've said, it's, it's kind of had an effect on the music that's related to the films, the way a film could be edited, the way a film could be shot, from a performance stance. And drugs are always going to be with us. Drugs are never going to disappear. And there'll always be a new drug to talk about. And for a new generation to take and understand and then for a bunch of people to be like, this is bad, and maybe it's bad, who knows. Yeah, I guess we'll find out, won't we? Yeah. Watch this space. <laughs> So, thanks guys for listening to the podcast hope you guys enjoyed um, as ever like I said well, for the last few weeks our first six episodes of the podcast are on Spotify now so you can check that out under Trash Arts Tick um, we've also got our website which we've launched um, a few weeks ago which is www.trasharts.co.uk please check out that out we'll put a link in the description below and um, please leave us a like leave us a comment Subscribe and uh, other than that, guys, trash arts take out. Bye bye. Ta da. <laughs>